Coming up on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, want to know about multiple sclerosis? We'll be talking about it with Kumar Hari from the Myelin Repair Foundation. Up next on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with Dr. Kiki Sanford and Leo Laporte, episode number 27 for Friday, December 18th, 2009. New directions for multiple sclerosis research. Dr. Kiki's Science Hour is brought to you by the new voice-activated sync, featuring hands-free calling, music search, and turn-by-turn -turn navigation, available exclusively on Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury vehicles. For more details, visit SyncMyRidePodcast.com. This is Dr. Kiki's Science Hour with... Dr. Kiki Sanford and Leo Laporte. Hello, Dr. Kiki. Hello. And I should be your stupid sidekick. <laughs> You're not stupid. Don't you need though. like the stupid sidekick? <laughs> oh, Dr. Kiki, hi. What no. is science? No. No? No. That's what they usually have on one of these shows. A numbskull. I play both those parts myself. <laughs> You're the bird brain. The bird brain. That's right. Um, this is episode number 27, and today we're talking about multiple sclerosis and the science of figuring out what is actually going on with this disease. Multiple sclerosis is also known as MS, and it's an autoimmune disorder in which the body's immune system actually attacks the, uh, the myelin sheath, the coating that insulates our nerves. And usually, it usually keeps our nerves transmitting those electrical signals that let us move and talk and think and do everything really smoothly. But when the body attacks them, that the sheath turns into scar tissue or a plaque or a sclerosis, sclerosis and you end up with um, problems with the propagation of those electrical signals. And so people with multiple sclerosis end up having movement disorders, problems with their sight, vision, all, all, anything that is dependent upon these electrical signals can be affected. And there's a prevalence range, according to Wikipedia, anywhere between 2 and 150 people per 100,000. That's a pretty wide range. Um, and so, but it, but it is very prevalent. Um, the United States is, and the, the North American continent is, has a higher, has a fairly high prevalence compared to other countries in the world. And today we're going to talk about what's going on in the research community, figuring out, uh, what we know about multiple sclerosis, um, looking at the research paths, to figure out more about it and also to potentially figure out treatments for the future. And we're joined today by Dr. Kumar Hari, who is the director of uh, the director of discovery biology at the Myelin Repair Foundation, which is located in Saratoga, California. Thank you very much for joining us today. You're very welcome, Kiki. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. Um, now, the Myelin Repair Foundation, can you tell us a little bit about what you do there specifically? Sure. So the Myelin Repair Foundation uh, began as a concept back in 2002, uh, largely driven by its founder, Scott Johnson, who was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis by now uh, over 20 years ago. And at the time, uh, it, it took a while for him to decide that he um, really wanted to focus in on uh, finding new therapeutics for the disease. But what he really recognized at the time was how long it was taking to bring new therapies to market. And he decided that that was a challenge he really wanted to combat. So in setting up the Myelin Repair Foundation, um, he really needed to identify where the where the major roadblocks were and what he recognized was that first of all there's a lot that's not known about the basic biology of the sheath that you described earlier the myelin sheath uh, which surrounds nerve cells and protects the electrical conductance along the nerves um, but second of all he recognized that even when basic biology discoveries were being made there was a real roadblock in being able to translate those discoveries into pharmaceutical therapies and so that that's uh, 
uh, really the area of concern that he focused the most on, and it's it's where the Myelin Repair Foundation hopes to uh, have the most progress. Where do you think it stands? Uh, the the state of um, research stands currently. Um, my mother, my my mother is uh, diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I when I remember when she was diagnosed, okay. it was it was going to be like. 30 years before there was a there was a treatment or a therapy is there is that kind of length of time what we're still looking at is um, and and how is the myelin repair foundation working to make that shorter if it is still that long right well we we certainly hope that that 30 year time horizon is is no longer the case uh, i think coming from an academic, academic background as 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 you do and as i do you know we typically hear that the the time frame for bringing new therapies to market is somewhere of order 10 years but i think um, it, it really does depend on the state of the basic biology it really does depend on how far current treatments have come and so if we look in the field of, of multiple sclerosis a lot of the fda approved therapies really have to do with um, one aspect of the disease and so um, trying to bring newer therapies to market ones that focus specifically on repairing damaged myelin is really the focus of the myelin repair foundation mm -hmm. and and the thought process there is if we're able to combat um, multiple aspects of this complex disease we can really have a much more effective uh, collection of therapies that are out on the market can you tell us what do we know currently about the the biology of myelin? How much how much sure. do we know? Sure. So uh, that it's complicated. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if if we consider the sheath itself, though, I mean, we we know that it's made up predominantly of lipids, maybe about eighty percent, and then about twenty percent of that sheath is is uh, protein itself. Um, we know again that the sheath is required to protect protect uh, nerves both in the central nervous system as well as the peripheral nervous system, uh, protect their conductive properties. Um, we even know uh, quite a bit about the the way that the electrical signals get sent down uh, the axons of the nerves, which are the long spines of the nerves, uh, which is by a process called saltatory conduction. It's essentially jumping of the electrical currents. And when the myelin sheath is destroyed, uh, you lose the efficiency of that jumping process. And so while there is some residual conductance within those nerves, uh, you don't get, as you said earlier, the swiftness of that process. And so that's what leads to a lot of these, um, uh, a lot of these symptoms that patients face, including you know, tingling in their extremities, some of the, the uh, optic defects that occur in patients. And so, um, so a lot is known about the basic composition of myelin. A lot is known about what happens when uh, degeneration occurs and its function is impaired. Um, there's uh, quite a bit known uh, about the process that cells are using to uh, uh, attack the myelin. And as you mentioned, it, it's thought to be an autoimmune process where it's really the, the body attacking itself and attacking the myelin as the target of its, of its you know, venom, if you, if you will. Um, but really, the basic biology, how, how one cell contacts another to make the myelin really rebuild um, the, and protect the electrical conductance around the nerve is, is still a, a wide open area of study. And uh, it, it's, a, it's really a complicated process. There are a lot of different cell types involved. And in fact, when you get into situations where we're talking about immune attacks against the body, you bring in yet another layer of cells that uh, have a really uh, major impact impact on how uh, the nerves are functioning. Are you, are you looking at all at, at um, what, what triggers, what internal kinds of uh, signaling might be going on to actually tell the body that, hey, you should punch me, you know, <laughs> hey, it's, immune system, come beat me up. I mean, what, what's going a, on there? It's a great question. Um, and in fact, there, there, isn't conclusive evidence today that tells us what some definitive trigger might be. Uh, you know, one of the going theories really has to do with um, uh, what a lot of people are calling molecular mimicry. That is, uh, the body is recognizing the myelin as something foreign because there's something about the myelin that in its past it had recognized as foreign. So what might be the trigger for that? You know, one thought is that there are maybe certain viruses that infected the body uh, that, that stimulate this 
this response to self. But uh, the, again, the data is quite inconclusive. I think there, there are some studies now where people look at individual cells trying to identify a virus that, that is the trigger. And, and it's yeah. really, um, it, it's hard to, hard to know right now. The jury's still out on, on where the trigger really lies. Yeah, and that, and that's kind of the case for a lot of these autoimmune diseases, where I mean, you have like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus and um, and and multiple sclerosis and many others, where the where the autoimmune where the immune system just starts attacking the body. It starts doing yes. something happens, and it seems like I mean these are all different diseases, but I mean, are people thinking there's some kind of link between them, or is is there anything that that that's they- suggesting that? Are and it and it, it gets you know even more wild than some of the diseases you, you described. I mean, if you just consider uh, people with peanut allergies or people with dermatitis, I mean, these are all uh, at some level immune system defects, and it's very difficult to know uh, why the immune system uh, becomes hypersensitive. I mean, you know, the, the current topic of the day, H1N1 infections, um, it's really unknown why people with very healthy immune systems are having such a dramatic. A negative um, reaction to having this virus, but in fact, healthy people are the ones who appear to be the most afflicted by by H one N one. So again, it, the 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 triggers are really unclear why the system gets hyper stimulated. But you brought up a really good question about. Um, overlap in disease, and and there there is some genetic evidence um, suggesting that there are uh, corollaries between different autoimmune diseases. Um, and I think there was one paper published in New England Journal of Medicine a few years back that even talked about um, markers of type one diabetes that appeared to overlap with uh, genetic markers in multiple sclerosis patients. But the, for for MS, the real take home is the 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 correlation to genetics is. Uh, spotty at best. Um, You can look at monozygotic and dizygotic twins and see some evidence of correlation, but if you go out to the general population, that that correlation really falls off. Yeah, so uh, somebody in the the chat room here was asking about HLA phenotypes. Is there anything anything here. yeah so so that's really the the major one there is a human leukocyte antigen and, and an allele of that antigen which is found on the surface of the cells called dr2 and that that today for ms patients appears to be the one that's most correlated with disease um, but again i think even in in twin studies the the height of that correlation is you know up in the 25 to 30 percent range so um and yeah, not something that we could point our finger at and really uh, drive the studies, although very good um, in terms of trying to come up with early stage predictive um, values. Right. So it's, it's a kind of thing where if you went and had your, your, your gene sequence, your genome sequenced, which is getting more and more feasible these days, and you found that you have a particular allele for, that's correlated with a higher propensity for multiple sclerosis or one of these autoimmune diseases, it's predictive, but not necessarily. That's that's right. And in fact, you know, diagnosis of multiple sclerosis is such a tricky deal that um, really people are still relying to large degree on um, clinical signs and clinical symptoms. So relapse. Really? really there's no test for it, for instance. There's no single test for multiple sclerosis today. Um, there are a lot of a lot of studies now uh, surrounding, you know, what are called biomarkers for disease where um, people are really trying to identify single pro- proteins or patterns of proteins or even changes in certain proteins in the body that correlate with disease. But again, no, no straight uh, predictor that's out on the market today. Um, yeah, it really, MRI is being used as a marker, an imaging marker for diagnosis. And, and while it's, it's, it's quite good and it's been very useful in clinical studies you know, as, a, as a diagnostic, as a predictor, um, we, we hope that we can do better. In terms of the research that the research directions that you're looking at right now, um, what what directions? Uh, you mentioned myelin repair earlier, so I'm assuming that that's looking at people who have multiple sclerosis. They have damage to their myelin, and it's not necessarily stop. Is it not necessarily stopping the body from attacking the myelin, but then but but instead repairing it once it's been damaged? 
Right. So uh, this is this is where we think a lot about um, what aspects of our therapeutic intervention or therapeutic interventions that exist for patients uh, will, will really prove themselves to be myelin reparative. So if you could stop the attack, uh, uh, ongoing attack, which is what's happening with a lot of the currently approved therapies, they're all immunosuppressive reagents. And it turns out that the body, you know, as most patients with relapsing or emitting courses know, uh, can re repair itself pretty well. Well, um, the problem is when those attacks are accumulative and progress over time, then you start getting into problems with uh, injury to the nerve cells themselves. And that's where we hope that myelin reparative therapies can really um, uh, block that particular uh, injurious action. So um, really the, the line of of research uh, for the principal investigators who are involved with the Myelin Repair Foundation has to do with both aspects of disease, both the uh, immune system component as well as the basic biology of myelination and trying to uh, either stimulate normally reparative processes or figure out how to fix them when they've, uh, when they've been broken. So are you finding, have you already um, located or, or found any of these reparative processes, the, the internal processes that naturally go into repairing the myelin? Well, again, this is another, it's a difficult question. Again, when, when, we, when we set up the Myelin Repair Foundation, it was pretty clear that there wasn't a whole lot known about the basic processes of myelination. And so it's quite interesting. Scott Johnson, as, as sort of an entrepreneur in the Silicon Valley, he didn't, hadn't had uh, you know, a detailed PhD training in science or anything like that, but he, he went to a scientific conference, um, the, the Myelin Gordon Conference, and really talked to people and tried to figure out where the current state of research was. And I think he, he recognized at an early stage that, that there needed to be support for the basic biology in addition to uh, trying to figure out how therapies could be um, uh, made possible through that line of research. And so, I mean, I should mention in terms of the Myelin Repair Foundation, there are four principal investigators that work with the consortium currently, um, Ben Barris at Stanford University, uh, Brian Popko at the University of Chicago, uh, Robert Miller at Case Western Reserve University, and Stephen Miller at uh, Northwestern University. And these four and their laboratory the students, the postdocs, the technicians who do all the work, they, they really are the engine uh, for the Myelin Repair Foundation. And, and it's been a, a great consortium, great work to get them all um, collaborating and trying to answer these questions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, is there anything that, that, that you're finding? I mean, where, where's the state of your research now? Like what are, what are the, some really exciting results that you've right. had recently that, you know, just have, have you, you all very excited, the people you've you've just mentioned and um, people at the Myelin Repair Foundation just excited about? Yeah, I'd, I'd probably put them in three categories. So, I mean, I'd start with some of the, the, the basic processes of myelination. Uh, uh, two of the labs have been able to find um, two uh, genes in mice that when mutated appear to be these master regulators of the myelination process. And, um, you know, they're, they're typical master regulators. They have effects on lots of downstream uh, other genes. And so uh, that, that line of study will hopefully bring us into an area where we can be more specific about the types of uh, targets from a pharmaceutical perspective that we would want to uh, promote into development and really try to identify um, um, drug modifying therapies against. So, so that's the first line. It's it's again from the basic perspective, um, l genes like that hadn't been recognized uh, in earlier research. Uh, the second line of really exciting data has to do with uh, part of the basic process of, of multiple sclerosis, which is um, um, creating holes within the blood-brain barrier, which allows uh, immune cells to enter the central nervous system. Um, I mean, this is in fact uh, one of the modifying therapies um, on the market today. Tysabri, uh, its its um, mechanism of action is meant to keep those uh, inflammatory cells from crossing the blood-brain barrier and entering the CNS. Right. And, the, and, and the issue with with them crossing the blood-brain barrier normally normally the the blood-brain barrier is a barrier so that it protects all the important cellular machinery inside of the brain from any kind of um, infection or damage. And so when that's, that's right. Yeah. And, and if these so, immune cells get in and they start, uh, start damaging the myelin 
on your central nervous system, I mean, that's, that's where problems really start to happen, right? That, that's exactly right. And the, the, that barrier that you described, it, it's, it's uh, you know, there's some thought that um, that barrier um, allows the central nervous system to be what's, what's often considered immunoprivileged so that you don't get this hyper stimulative uh, immune response within the central nervous system. Um, I, I think, um, one of the interesting things that we're finding with the blood brain barrier are the types of cells um, that are involved in creating that barrier and also how those cells are interacting with um, uh, the blood vessel and the vasculatures uh, within the blood brain barrier to uh, keep it sort of uh, keep its integration intact so it's uh, it, that's a really interesting line of study going on with mrf again from a basic biology perspective um and i think uh, the third area of study which has got us really excited um, is sort of a little outside the realm of basic biology and, and more towards the realm of trying to translate these discoveries into uh, programs that pharmaceutical companies would be really interested in to pick up and carry forward. And this has to do with the animal models that are used to test these agents uh, for their effects in, in um, disease modifying action um, and the gold standard for multiple sclerosis uh, in terms of doing testing in animals is uh, our mouse models um, of what's called a allergic uh, excuse me experimental allerg allergic encephalomyelitis or EAE and this is essentially a, a model where one stimulates an allergic reaction within uh, the animal uh, that's guided towards the myelin sheath and uh, it recapitulates a lot of the symptoms of human disease, including uh, relapsing courses or chronic courses, oh. or um, um, uh, just a lot of the, the ways that the immune system would react to, to being hyperstimulated against the myelin proteins. Oh. Um, but it, it, it's an interesting model in that, again, it's the gold standard. It's the one that industry uses quite often in terms of um, uh, doing their own drug development. But uh, a lot of therapies that appear to be active in combating EAE in animal models have no effect in humans. And so uh, there's a real need for coming up with new models of uh, multiple sclerosis in animals so that early stage discoveries can be uh, measured. And, and we've come up with um, two different animal models now that don't rely um, specifically on stimulating the immune system. And what that allows us to do is study specifically the role of, of um, the cells in the central nervous system and their ability to repair, uh, not only on their own, but also um, perhaps our ability to stimulate that process um, when damage has occurred. So those are three exciting areas of research going on at MRF right now. Yeah, they sound they sound really exciting. The uh, the the really interesting stuff there. I mean, from the 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 blood brain barrier research. I mean, that has implications. I mean, if you understand more about how the the blood brain barrier works and how it interacts with immune cells and and uh, even other cellular types, it it goes a long way toward uh, understanding what would allow it to open up? You know, how are these holes forming in the blood brain barrier to allow immune cells through? Um, understanding that could even be translated and applied to pharmaceuticals, where in the pharmaceutical industry, there's often drug delivery that you want to get into the brain, but you can't get it there because of the blood brain barrier. So that even beyond just um, understanding it for, for multiple, multiple sclerosis sake, um, there's a, a basic understanding there that can go have a lot, lot broader reach. Yeah, you really. Hit and the then, um, in terms um, of the animal models, I, I'm just thinking that uh, figuring out why certain animal models, you know, don't react to the treatments that seem to help people. Is it just because of the gen gen the genetics of the animal are different? What's actually happening? Are we not actually modeling the disease, even though the symptoms look the same? Yeah, it's all. Those are all great questions. I, I mean, they're are aspects of the length of disease courses in the animal models that probably don't predict what's going on in humans. Mm -hmm. um, there are aspects of um, a 
process really that that Steve Miller at Northwestern has worked on throughout his career, uh, known as um, epitope spreading, and uh, it's kind of a complicated idea. But essentially, um, you know, the part of the protein that your body first reacts to might be different from the part of the protein that your body reacts to in subsequent um, relapses. Uh, and so there is a question about how much these models of, of EAE and mice recapitulate that particular activity in humans. Um, it appears that it might, but there's a lot more study that would need to be done. Yeah, it sounds like it. I'm just, I'm, and, and the fact there are, there are multiple forms of multiple sclerosis as well. So you may, you've mentioned the relapsing remitting form where you you get sick and then your body fixes itself and you get, and you get better and you can, you don't have the tingling, you don't have the loss of motion, any of those issues. But then there's also um, a more progressive forms. And so you have primary progressive, you have secondary progressive, um, where primary progressive is just progressive all the way along. You don't really have, you might, or, or secondary progressive, you might start out with what seems to be a relapsing remitting, but actually there's just damage building up and you're just getting worse and worse and worse. Um, I'm just wondering if if you find those different phenotypes in the animal models, if there so, is, you know, if there are certain genotypes that underlie, underlie the way that the body actually reacts to the assault on the nervous system and then how right. that actually plays out. Right. That That's interesting. You know, the, the genotype aspect of that, um, uh, I mean, there are certain, there are certain strains of mice that, that probably react differently to the stimulant. Um, but in terms of being able to reproduce, let's say, a relapsing remitting course versus a chronic course, you can certainly do that in the mouse models. It has more to do with how you stimulate the reaction than um, maybe specifically about the strain of mice. But I think that that is it's an open area of study to try to uh, figure out how correctly those mouse models recapitulate the human disease courses. Yeah. And I think e even in the human state, it's very difficult to know, uh, let's say, when a person who presents for the relapsing remitting course, uh, whether they may or may not um, progress to a secondary progressive state. It, it's even difficult in the humans to know when that might occur. Right. Right. Absolutely. I'm, I'm, I'm also thinking about these different, uh, these different types of, of, I guess, how, how the multiple sclerosis actually um, is expressed in, in different people and, um, you know, the different treatments and how, and how, what we're using now, they seem to be, since we know it's an immune disease disorder, we're using kind of these gross immune system modulating treatments, or we know it's inflammatory. So let's give you an anti-inflammatory, but there's nothing actually specific that we're, we're, we're not able to really you know, send, we're not we're able to pinpoint it. We're not going to, we're not getting there with like the laser beam focus of knowing exactly what we can target and how to, how to fix it. In terms of the research directions that, um, that different groups are going, I mean, what do you think is driving the different research focuses and, and, and getting to certain solutions? Yeah, I, that's a great question. Um, I mean, I can certainly speak to it from the Myelin Repair Foundation perspective, which is um, while the immune system modulators uh, uh, certainly appear to be efficacious in a subset of the of the patients who take them, um, we we just fully believe that there has to be uh, some component of repair that allows. Uh, damage that isn't fully resolved to be resolved. And, and that is the way to get patients back to sort of a ground zero state um, because that damage just continues to accumulate um, even um, in patients who do receive those immune modulating therapies, although um, it's pretty variable uh, who responds and how well they respond. Right. Um, I think a lot of the field, it's quite interesting that there's a lot of studies coming out now where um, people are looking at um, adult stem cell therapies and their ability to um, stimulate repair uh, in the central nervous system. And um, there, there's, some, there's some good data there um, where early clinical trials 
trials appear to be showing positive effects. Um, I think that comes with a lot of uh, attendant uh, issues with people's own thoughts about stem cells and their right. ability to repair. There's also some basic um, questions about is it the stem cell itself or something that the stem cell is secreting? Because right. again, th there is the body has an ability to repair and, and we see that um, not only in these patient courses but also in the animal models that we're working on um, and I, I think if we can get to that point where we're stimulating repair before the amount of injury is sort of overtakes the body's ability to to affect that repair um, we'd be in really good shape so I see those as, as two uh, general courses that the field is taking we have a lot of uh, a lot of comments in the in the the chat room about various various um, kind of ans ancillary ancillary yeah I guess that works ans <laughs> ancillary issues uh, to do with uh, MS and and research and treatment um, uh, one of one of the things that um, that I've seen on the web I mean there you, you go on the web and there it's it's like any topic there's all these things, bee sting therapy, if you have vitamin D, you'll be fine. If you, you know, smoke a little weed, that'll help. You know, um, how does, how, coming from a research perspective, going from, you know, as a scientist looking into how the body works, how the body's attacking itself, how it's reacting to those uh, attacks and how we can stop that, fix it, et cetera. Um, you know, how do, how do you, what do you tell the average person who's, looking on the web for something, you know, to, to help them out. Boy, that's a difficult one. Yeah. You know, it, it's interesting. You and I, you and I share uh, a, a couple things, which I realized earlier today. I mean, the first is uh, we were both research techs at UC Davis, so that's, that's <laughs> go <right>. ags. Um, <laughs> the, the second, though, is, you know, I, I also have a, a family member who uh, is affected by multiple sclerosis, which, of course, affects the whole family. Yeah. And it, it is. It's difficult to know... Uh, what to say when, you know, from a science background, um, every academic discovery is, you know, the next silver bullet. And I think, um, I think it's incumbent upon scientists, and I know a lot of people are probably not going to be happy with this line of response, but I think right. it's incumbent upon, you know, the academic scientists and the scientific community uh, to to make people aware that the goal of these therapies uh, is not only to solve disease, but it's to it's to be safe, and it, we need to be um, as effective as possible at the same time that we're treating people in a safe manner. Um, and so, I, I have mixed feelings about this myself. I think. Um, uh, the academic research that we do is so incredibly important just to understanding the basic processes going on um, when two cells talk to one another. Yeah. Um, but I think to translate that into something meaningful, into it, yeah, something meaningful and into a therapy that we would use to help a patient. Um, uh, I mean, we all want that to go as fast as humanly possible. And, and I see, again, all the postdocs and graduate students and technicians working in the laboratories associated with MRF, they're all burning the midnight oil, trying to make this happen as fast as possible. But also in, in with as careful science as we can do and in the safest manner possible. And I think you know, we as scientists, um, it, it's our responsibility to manage those expectations. We, we have to manage uh, and balance those two things for, for patients who they don't want to go to their PhDs and figure this out, right? They want treatments now and so do we. And we're doing our very best and working as hard as we possibly can to make that happen. Great. Um, do we want to go to Twalkin and maybe some talk ask and calls. some, get yeah. some get I'd love some to get more Twalkin calls, know. though. If people are listening, they can call uh, Twalkin at 218-548-9255. The pin is 1304, and then you hit the pound sign, but they walk you through that. J.K. Powers has been very patient, hanging on the line. Hanging on the line. Hi, J.K. Powers. Thanks for calling in. Thank you for having me. Big fan of the show. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I just, it might be kind of a basic question, but I was uh, wondering how doctors uh, can determine what other possible causes of uh, multiple sclerosis symptoms, like 
uh, inflammatory disorders, uh, structural damage in the brain, how, how do they differentiate those uh, symptoms from multiple sclerosis and other diseases? Especially since there's no test for MS. Right. You right. have to be, do it based on symptoms. Right. Do you have any answer to this, Kumar? No, that that's exactly right. Um, it would depend largely on symptomology and disease course. I mean, there, there are a lot of um, uh, there are a lot of MS-like diseases uh, out there. I mean, even something as basic as Lyme disease appears to present with a lot of symptoms that look like MS. Um, there's actually not great tests right now for Lyme disease as well, except to try to identify the bacterium that causes it. Yeah. Um, uh, but, you know, in terms of multiple sclerosis, I mean, one of, one of the better diagnostics uh, has to do with um, a procedure that's a bit difficult, a lumbar puncture, where you're looking for um, banding patterns of proteins in the cerebrospinal fluid that appear to correlate with antibodies being produced in that fluid. Uh, and even that's not 100%. So um, it, it's, it's a bit tricky. I think it, it's, it's an unfortunate case that even patients before they know have MS don't recognize some of the early symptoms. And so it's not until you sort of have a second attack that a uh, real definitive diagnosis can occur. And, I, and frankly, that that's a, an area of, of huge study right now. And it's a place where um, uh, the Myelin Repair Foundation really wants to focus on trying to identify uh, earlier stage biomarkers, not only for diagnostics, but also if we're able to identify therapies that we hope to be myelin reparative, that those same biomarkers would show us uh, efficacy of those modifying therapies as we're doing clinical trials. Right. Yeah, it, see, it seems the earlier, and, I, and I've heard with a lot of the, the current treatments and therapies that we have now, the earlier you we can catch it, uh, the better the prognosis seems to be, the, the less damage there is that seems to be done. So, um, it and, and is that because of the effectiveness of the therapies? Must be right. I think in um, in the um, immunomodulatory uh, reducing the uh, the I guess the attack the number of attacks on yeah. on the body. If you can keep the body from attacking itself, you're going to keep the amount right. of damage. So you have down. effective therapies. Then there are some. There are there. You know, not 100 uh, percent right. for sure. Um, uh, and, and in terms of the, the diagnosis, Dr. Mom in the chat room says it is a diagnosis of exclusion. Right. That's exactly right. That not, can't be anything else. Must be this. Must be this. Right. And I, I just remember, you know, personal anecdote here. My, when my mom was diagnosed, it was at first uh, she had some trouble playing the piano and it was diagnosed as carpal tunnel. Huh. Um, and so she actually, you know, that's what we thought it was for a long time. And then symptoms started to change a little bit. And so that's when the diagnosis changed. And it was years later that um, an MRI was actually done and, and they actually saw physical damage. And so that was like, yeah, now we know for sure you have it. <laughs> but it's all, it, that's exactly what it was, was a diagnosis of exclusion. Well, okay, that right. went away. So this, that's what this must be. But it would have been nice to know sooner because you could have treated it and reduced its uh, yeah. severity. Right. Yeah. Exactly. What that, kind does your ha mom have? Uh, my mom has a progressive form progressive. of MS. Yeah. yeah. That's much more serious, isn't it? Than uh, remission. What is it? Rem re Rem relapsing, remitting. Relapsing, remitting. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, who, who? Montel Williams, um, and it's a, the, some of there are some of the major celebrities. A couple. Montel Williams is right. one. Right. Um, I think he has relapsing, remitting. Um, there's right. uh, I can't remember the name. Of, there's another celebrity out there. Valerie Bertinelli. Is that right? No. Am I right? Am I wrong? I don't, no, I don't know if Valerie Bertinelli. I don't think it's Valerie. I think, don't listen yeah. to me. <laughs> Let's not give her something she doesn't I know. She don't, don't, exactly. don't listen exactly. to me there. Yeah. There's, but there's, a, um, there's another celebrity out there who has uh, relapsing. Does Michael J. Fox have MS? He has Parkinson's Parkinson's, disease. okay. Yeah. Which, it, speaking of stem cell therapies, I, I thought it was interesting that you brought that up uh, relating to multiple sclerosis because I didn't realize that was being considered. I know for Parkinson's. That's right. something they've looked that's at a, a lot, and it's had kind yeah. of yeah. varying results, some really that's bad right. and some okay. That's right. The president I, on West Wing had relapsing remitting. That's right. Yeah. A celebrity on TV. On TV. And on. in real life. And that <laughs> Actually, it was good that he did Funicello. that. Funicello. That's who I was Funicello, Funicello. Yeah. But it's good that they did that on West Wing, because I think that raised the awareness for a lot of people. Yes. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, And the majority of people seem to have the relapsing remitting form. Um, That seems to be the the primary form that I think it's like 90 to 95 percent of the of um, people who have have MS. That's what they have. And so that's where actually the the priority for a lot of these therapies and research is actually directed because that's the majority of people and what they have. Right. Um, it's a it's a tricky situation. I think you know you're right. There's a very very high proportion of people who present with relapsing remitting uh, courses, um, but from from what I understand, it also uh, is the case that a number of these people with the RMS form do convert to the secondary progressive form, and I think it it, it has to do scientifically. Um, with the body not being able to fully repair the damage that has occurred. And so the hope is these immunomodulatory therapies, like you say, would, would lessen the course. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we need, to, we need to think about ways to really affect repair. So to, again, get patients back to a state where they have, you know, 100% function. Yeah. Um, somebody in the chat room is asking, what area of the world has the highest MS occurrence? And I think it's actually in Northern Hemisphere. Um, North America, actually. It's 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 purely it's anecdotal, a, but I know so many people who have it, and yeah. uh, it just seems like it's very it's 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 very widespread. What percentage of the population gets it, Kumar? Do you know? Um, I I don't know full percentages. I think the incidence rates in the U.S. Uh, currently are in the four hundred thousand range, and worldwide, I think two and a half million people. So. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I guess we could do the calculation of, you know, six right. plus billion people right. and figure right. that one out. It's not, it's not that it's common. Tr- it just it's seems not, like it is. It, it, it does. I think everybody or a lot of people know somebody who's affected by multiple sclerosis, at least in the circles that I travel in. And yeah. um, I think that uh, there are certainly environmental and geographic factors affecting the disease. And it's just yet another, you know, layering of, you know, of confusion on top of how we do the diagnosis, how we handle the modifying therapies, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's a very complicated disease. Yeah, there's a... Um there's a map from Wikipedia um, that has it has a distribution of uh, multiple sclerosis throughout the world, and it's it's pretty striking. At um, the northern hemisphere is you know the, the the color frame color goes from kind of gray for no data, light yellow, all the way up to red for the most cases, and the northern hemisphere is just orange and red. Huh. <laughs> it seems to be right. seems to be a very uh, northern affliction. So maybe it is vitamin D. <laughs> maybe it's vitamin D deficiency. We just we just really don't know, huh? We have no idea. Isn't that interesting? No idea. So we know that it's uh, so northern hemisphere. We also know the majority of people uh, the majority of people who get it are women. So maybe there's a hormone basis to it. Both guys somehow. I know who have it are men, obviously because they're guys. <laughs> but that's interesting. So women more preponderance. Yeah, yeah, more pre- yeah more more in, in females than in males. Um, yeah. And there are clinical trials, in fact, uh, for estradiol or, um, in terms of trying to find out um, whether those therapies could be effective in um, women because uh, and a lot of women who um, undergo pregnancy while they have the disease apparently report that uh, they've never felt better except when they were pregnant. And so huh. um, there, there are some uh, academic medical centers taking advantage of that and trying to uh, go follow that line of study. Could also be, I mean, you're pregnant and the, uh, the, feel, little, the wee one inside of you suppresses yeah. your immune system right. so that you don't attack it. Right. <laughs> so right. it could be it's a natural immune suppression of right. pregnancy. Right. Right. <laughs> could be hormones, could be these other things. This is, um, this is just fascinating. Do we have any more calls or comments? We don't. Is that it? Okay. We don't. Um, just I have a Ford commercial, which I'd like to do. Great. And, uh, and then- I could talk briefly about that. We'll get back to more of... Uh, yeah, Our but guest, I think, and I think we all have to uh, wrap it up fairly soon. Pretty because... soon, but we'll give you a little extra okay. time because I ate into your time, and I'm a bad, bad man, but we don't have our Twit Holiday Special is coming up in just a little bit. I do want to mention our friends at Ford who do the Sync My Rides stuff. Uh, the Sync is an amazing technology that goes in Ford, Lincoln, and Mercury vehicles. In fact, if you're getting a new car, you should absolutely look at it. I have tried all the in-car you know, hands-free systems, all the in-car uh, audio systems, and this is the one you want. It has a USB connector, 
so you can connect almost any device to it. It also has an audio jack. That'll get everything else that, you does, that doesn't have USB. It also uh, bonds with your Bluetooth phones. I have three different phones. Now. I know I'm not usual, but you can get up to 25 phones automatically connecting. And it does Bluetooth audio, which is fantastic. So when I get in the car, my music starts playing from my iPhone. Uh, it also um, gives you information. GPS, turn-by-turn -turn directions, not with a big screen, but by talking to you. The whole idea is it's for safety. You keep your hands on the wheel, your eyes on the road, and yet you can do all those things that you want to do in your car. You could say, uh, play Dr. Kiki's Science Hour, number 27. You can say, play the Beatles, uh, play Metallica, whatever. You can say, play next, play previous, stop. You could play similar. You have complete control of the climate. You can say, give me sports scores, movie times, fuel prices you can navigate it's just amazing i mean this is really the next generation of automotive computing and it's right now in all ford lincoln and mercury vehicles find out more go to syncmyridepodcast.com you can get a demo there it'll take you over to the sync my ride site which is the site for sync owners it's it's i mean I, I get vehicle history reports all sorts of things just from my car and so i want you to try it out syncmyridepodcast.com we are so grateful to ford for sponsoring uh, all of our shows on Twitter, and especially Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Dr. Yeah. Kiki? Especially Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, Kumar, are you, do you think there's going, I mean, just looking at it from a research angle and understanding, um, you know, all the potential influences, the cellular, um, viral, genetic um, to multiple sclerosis. Do you think there's, I mean, it's going to be one cure-all? Are we going to find a sil silver bullet? Or is, do you think this is going to turn into lots of different research paths, go finding all sorts of things that we might mix and match? Uh, I think it's a layering. I, I think um, today, I, I wouldn't say we know enough about the basic biology to dis or exclude the fact that there might be you know, a, a silver bullet. I, I think though what we would say by looking at all available current data is that there's probably um, uh, probably some sort of combination therapy uh, that we would have to use uh, to really have the best impact on patients um, again today. Uh, it's always this, this hope that we bring because uh, um, when, again, when the MRF was started and when we're looking at a lot of the data that, that are coming out now, there's still so many questions to be asked about how uh, myelination occurs. I mean, because we didn't really touch on this too much, but yeah. the, the, um, the nerve cell uh, around which this myelin sheath is, is made is, is not itself the cell that creates that sheath. That's a second cell uh, which is called an oligodendrocyte, and that cell needs to somehow um, be be motivated to myelinate an axon. And in fact, um, that cell, as resident in the brain, is in a precursor state. So it itself needs to mature before it can go do its work. So uh, there's so many basic questions about how uh, differentiation and maturation of a, a precursor cell to an oligodendrocyte state occurs. So many questions about uh, in 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 longer term disease, are there effects uh, of injury to the axon that in fact are inhibitory to that oligodendrocyte trying to myelinate? Um, are there is the scarring actually having uh, some kind of physical uh, impact on keeping that oligodendrocyte from finding uh, the damaged nerve? It's just so many basic questions that we just don't have answers to today. Uh, so, you know, the hope really is that there would be um, you know, some type of, of single therapy or, you know, small combination of therapeutics that uh, really has the major impact for, for all patient populations. So if there's, there, I mean, is it daunting? I mean, there, knowing there are so many questions, I mean, there are a lot of people working on these questions, but at the same time, is it ever just like, <sighs> oh my gosh, we're never going to figure it out. I mean, sometimes I feel that way about different, different yeah. diseases and yeah. there's so much to learn. So there's so much to learn. Um, it, it's interesting. If it ever is, you know, I, I just go home and hang out with my family and real, remember why we're all doing this in the first place. So um, it, it's actually a unique 
aspect of the work that goes on at, at the Myelin Repair Foundation because as a nonprofit, I mean, our focus is not necessarily the basic science, it's the patients and really bringing therapies to patients faster and trying to figure out ways to do that more efficiently. And so it, it can be, I mean, you know, from a scientific perspective, it, it's it's all incredibly, incredibly interesting and there's just beautiful science going on and you can appreciate it from sort of the academic scientific perspective. But, you know, if you get tired, you, you feel daunted again, if, if you have these personal associations with, with these, these really horrible diseases, uh, you just go home and hang out with your family a little bit and crack some jokes and just realize how brave these people are. And, uh, you know, you, you just, you can't help but to regain your faith and go back and work a little harder. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I think that's probably a, a high note to leave, leave this show on. And um, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. Uh, spend a lot of good quality time with your family. I'm going to go do the same. And, Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, you as well. Tomorrow. Thank you Happy so much. Happy holidays to you both. Happy holidays to all your listeners. And thank you so much for your interest in the Myelin Repair Foundation and learning more about MS. MyelinRepair.org. Yeah. That's right. And Kumar Hari was our guest today on Dr. Kiki's Science Hour. Thank you very much. You can find Dr. Kiki's Science Hour in iTunes. We are, we have an RSS feed if you did not, uh, if you Yay. caught it live, if you're catching a Yay. rerun or you just caught this part feed. right now, you can Yay. go download, um, you can download Dr. Kiki's Science Hour and back episodes. There's four right or five now. episodes now, so yeah. that's great. There yeah. are a few episodes there to download. You don't just have to catch it live, although live is, Nice. Live is good. Live is good. Um, next week, we will be talking. In, in We're going to be here on Wednesday morning. Right, cause because we don't want to work Christmas Eve. We're not going to work Christmas Eve. I'm going to be driving to visit my family good. to spend that good quality good. time Christmas good. Eve. Um, but the day before Christmas Eve, we are going to be talking about the Ice Cube Project. <laughs> What's Sounds that? fitting, right? Yeah, for the, for the holiday yeah, season. Yeah. Um, well, the Ice Cube Project is in a very cold place, Antarctica, and it's underground in Antarctica. Even colder. Even colder. It's a giant underground freezing neutrino detector. Ooh, so neat. we're going to be talking about neutrinos and detecting them using uh, Antarctica, which will be a lot of fun. So we're going I to love neutrinos. That. Yeah, so that that is our that is what we're talking about next week and for our New Year's show coming up, we can look forward to talking about time and the atomic clock. I'm lining up an interview with a scientist from the National Institute of Standards and Technologies to talk about the atomic clock. We're going to talk about atoms and stuff. Tell. Yeah. Um, you can find me online at drkiki.tv, uh, at Dr. Kiki on Twitter. And uh, if you want to ask a question about neutrinos, the Ice Cube Project, or even putting it forward to the we atomic clock. We haven't used clock. Vidly. We didn't use Vidly today. We didn't we use Vidly. Use we some, tried the talk in. We can do talking and vidly. Yes. Why not? If you're sounding Why like not? a baby, you might as well go all the way. <laughs> and remember, if you're going to use vidly and send me a video comment or question, please use the hashtag pound sign DKSH for Dr. Kiki Science Hour. Um, yeah. You and can don't forget the evolution. What do they call it? Evolvums. 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 Evolvums.com slash twists. For a special discount. Yeah. What a good gift. Twist it great for yeah. kids of all ages yeah. like me. <laughs> uh, I notice you have quite a few. They're all mine. Is this your co your collection? <laughs> no, I'm giving a couple of these away. We actually had a are doing a giveaway on Twist this week in science, my oh, other uh, my radio show. We are um yeah, for people who write us Twistmas stories. They have to in include evolution, the idea, <laughs> ideas of evolution and twistmas. And we had we had a really great, great uh, and content content contest entry this last week, and so we already have one winner. This next week Twist we'll be giving away. Twist the night before twistmas. Yes. <laughs> and all through the house. And all through the house. The it was great. The albums are rocking. <laughs> yeah, we had uh, the story of it was a the story of Kirk Cameron. I, I on the Twist website twist.org for the show notes this week. I put the the entry. It's actually a brilliant, brilliant great. poem. That sounds great. Loved it. Wonderful. Yeah. Evolvums.com forward slash twist. Ten percent discount on these little cute little evolving animals. And that's well, it. That's thank it. you, Kiki. We're done. We're done. <laughs>